Friends, thank you for joining us this week. In our continuation of our first Chamber Series lectures, we're going to go into the topic tonight on wisdom and being. Uh, these are two very interesting concepts, and they are brought here into a single topic because in, in his phenomenal skillfulness, Samael allows us to explain what is the difference between acquiring wisdom and the development of a superior level of being. So if we were saying wisdom and being as the title of this lecture, or knowledge and beingness as the title, or wisdom and the level of being, we would not be departing too far away from the intent that the Master had when he left this material for us. So let's go ahead and start with, uh, with one of his quotes. And he says, It becomes necessary for us to understand the work that we create for ourselves as we study Gnosis. This is not to be taken lightly, more so when we willingly walk into the intermediate level of studies. Because when we are still in the pre-chamber, it is not uncommon for many of us to be uh, still butterflying around, still looking for, for something else, perhaps still looking for something that, that even complements the vastness of uh, the contents in the, in the pre-chamber. And, and in doing so, we may go through the pre-chamber, lecture over lecture, still with an interest to develop faculties or to develop abilities or to develop powers, perhaps uh, an intent to try to do some elemental magic and, and things of the sort. Hmm? So there, there is an element of curiosity that, that is triggered because of the fire, the longing of the being. But Samuel is telling us, we have to understand the work that we create for ourselves as we study Gnosis. And that happens because as we go into these studies, this is not only a study that we are applying to our individual and particular person. This is not only work that will affect us internally. This is work that will affect that, that, that initial dynamic of you with that with that legion of devilish egos that each one of us have. Hmm? But it's also going to affect that relationship between you and your spouse. It is going to affect the relationship with you and your children. And if you can imagine, it will also affect your relationship with people at work. It will affect relationship with your neighbors, with the community. And as you observe that we continue expanding the circle of influence, it will affect your relationship with your city, with your state, it will affect your relationship ultimately between you and your being. And in those changes, there are changes that we need to be willing to embrace because Gnosis, uh, <laughs> Gnosis characterizes itself for not necessarily making our initial stages in learning very easy when it comes to the life experience. It is not uncommon to hear people say, I have walked into the studies of Gnosis and my life used to be perfect before I got here. Hmm? And now all I have is problems. That is common. Perhaps you have said that. But this happens for a reason. And there is no way that we can exercise some good self-observation and some good discovery if the gymnasium is not harsh. So we need to understand the work that we create for ourselves because in that work that we create for ourselves, we start impacting everyone around us. And that is one of the main effects of this initiatic, Gnostic, esoteric wisdom. You know, it is initiatic because it shows us and it teaches us how to receive this wisdom so that we can apply it in this daily matter that is called life. So that we can learn to adapt to our most difficult circumstances so that we can become quick thinking. But quick thinking, not because we become very clever and very, and very, and very sleazy in, in our thinking, no. Quick thinking, because it helps us develop the ability of thinking without thinking. Quick thinking, because it gives us the ability to have deep, profound comprehension without the need to reason. And that is called intuition. So it is initiatic because of that. It is Gnostic because it looks for the experiential knowledge. It is, for, it is meant 
for you to be something that that you will be experiencing and that will be tangible to you uh, across your five senses. And then it is esoteric. Esoteric because it is occult. And at this level of study, we already know that occult does not mean satanic. We know that occult does not mean black magic. We know that occult means that it is hidden, it is veiled, and individually and particularly for each and every one of us, all of this experience has to be esoteric because all of the experiences that we get through Gnosis are very individual. They're very private. You can share your experience with anyone else. And as you do that, and as you do that, they will not be able to understand what you're saying. That experience will not resonate with most people or perhaps with anyone as strong as it resonates with you. And it has become because we have been making transitions life after life. And our conditioning, well, is what leads all of our egos to respond the way that they do. Our consciousness is, it, it operates based on its own conditioning. So this is the initiatic Gnostic esoteric wisdom. This is the teaching that we are receiving so that we can learn to live life as a path of initiation by embracing all of these experiences and turn them into a very personal, very intimate knowledge. This is what this does for us. And look, when, when we get involved in this work, we know that there are three factors of the revolution of consciousness. We know that we are immediately tempted to start sharing with people the experience of Gnosis. And perhaps if you have tried that, you have already seen that it gets difficult. Maybe you find yourself explaining things a lot. Maybe you find yourself explaining things more than what is necessary. And maybe people look at you and they feel uh, maybe a little threatened. Maybe they look at you different and they think that you are perhaps being uh, just too, too much into the spirituality. <laughs> and that is okay. But if you're going to share Gnosis, the first thing that we need to share is our actions. All of our actions need to be in satisfaction with the cosmic law of the Trogo Auto Ego Craft. Remember that law? That is the one law that states that all things benefit from each other. That everything nourishes out of everything else. And that there is a balance in nature. So, as you are sharing, let's share, but in terms of our actions. Let's make sure that our actions are always edifying. That our actions are dignifying. That they are essentially dignifying meaning that they dignify the essence hmm? and as people see our actions they will notice that there is something different as people see that events happen to you and that you are not reacting as people see that you go through difficult moments and that you still remain composed that you can still be a quote-unquote rock for others those those experiences from others as they observe you are very impactful and they cannot be discarded. So when we look at what we would refer to as the common folk, if we take a person who is ignorant and we choose to help them become better, someone else says we would have two things. We will find out that they know nothing and we will find out that their being has seen no development. These two are very important because if we go out and we start talking to people about invoking their divine mother, they have no knowledge of anything and their being has seen no development. Then they're not going to know what you're even saying. If you start uh, addressing conversations in terms of the ego and the ego this and the ego that and the effect of the ego and the cylinders of the human machine, uh, people are going to wonder what have you been drinking? <laughs> so we have to be very mindful about it. What is it that we are sharing? So Samael says, where is it that we start? Well, so Samael says, if we're going to start, we must start 
with the being. Hmm? We must start by making sure that our actions create a very profound impact in the consciousness of others. Because we all carry a connection between our consciousness and our being. As you know, the consciousness is just a spark that has emerged out of this wonderful infinite fire that is our spirit, our being. And they are intimately connected. So let's start by our actions creating a very profound impact in that consciousness so that we can start with their being. So let's look at the effect of anger. Let's look at the effect of jealousy, of rancor, of envy. Let's, for example, talk about resentment. Because resentment is a very poor negative emotion that we experience every single time we feel that we have been treated unfairly. And you do not have to feel, uh, you do not necessarily have to go through the experience of being treated unfairly to perceive or think or feel that you, that there has been some unfairness against you. Hmm? The fact that you have a notion of unfairness is just enough to trigger the spark of resentment. And when you are resentful, observe your behavior. It is very common for people to not address an unfair circumstance openly the moment that it happens. So they will remain quiet, they will feel hurt, they will walk away, and they will carry with them a series of negative emotions towards someone that will never be verbalized. They will not be vocalized. But you carry that hurt and that suffering within. So as you do that, the next time that something happens, even though it may be another little thing, you pepper, you season that second event with the old resentment that you carry from the first time. And then that second event becomes more meaningful and more significant. And the negative emotions of resentment are so toxic, they are so corrosive, that after two or three events, hmm, After a single event that may be fairly impactful for you, you may find yourself slandering. You may find yourself criticizing, judging. You may find yourself putting into full action all of your free free will, but turned into ill will towards somebody else. Before long, you look at them and you start suffering jealousy for for the advantages that they have that you don't. And then you want those things. Hmm? You may start experiencing envy. And as you see their advantages, you may not even be interested in having the same advantages as they do. But just because you see that they are enjoying that, you start wishing them to stop enjoying them. You start wishing them to all go away. So you see this? You see how much this has escalated? And these are things that happen in a week, in a month. There are resentments that we have been carrying from the time that we were children. And we carry them towards our parents. We carry them towards teachers that may not be alive yet already anymore. So this is a, it is a very serious burden of suffering that we carry. So we need to start with the being. And we need to start with those constructive actions. So notice how different your life experience and the experience of all the others would be. If rather than you remaining quiet because you are internally reacting, because one of the cylinders of your machine is reacting, meaning your emotional center is reacting, or your intellectual center is reacting, what if you were able to remain composed? What if you were able to observe your reaction and see how your thinking is getting affected? how your emotion is becoming tainted and how it is becoming of a negative nature. And as you do that, notice how much more wisdom you would gain about that particular devilish ego of resentment that is growing in you. Because as you do that, then you have the option. You have given yourself the opportunity of being in that third position where you can observe like the director who is directing the movie. Hmm? 
and not like the actor that is caught within the drama of the movie itself. And when you do that, you have an instant to keep the remembrance of self, to know yourself, and then to respond with action that is built in kindness, that is built in compassion. Because as part of that remembrance of self, you also remember that there is another consciousness trapped within that other personality, within that other body. And it makes a huge difference. So we create a very profound impact in others and we slowly start awakening their longing to be better. They see you different and they see that your life seems to be going better and they would like to know what is it that you're doing. They would like to know what is it that you're learning. And with that, the longing to be better, it gives you then the opportunity to share, to offer the Gnostic teaching of wisdom, but not before. Hopefully you can see how is it that these things unfold. Because we walk into this and many students get into this level of study and they have already read every single possible article book and blog that they can possibly find and they believe that the more information that they can continue cramming that all of that information will eventually make a difference and this is just one more of those fallacies of the ego Samael tells us you get more benefit from chanting mantras one hour a day than from reading a thousand books and who would have thought so knowing and being are different. Hmm? We may be able to know a lot, meaning we may be able to regurgitate a lot of crammed and memorized information. But that does not mean that we are achieving a superior level of being. That does not mean that we are making an internal change that is meaningful and that is significant. Hmm? We could end up with very high education and still live life with a very low morality. And we see that today in many of our politicians, in many of our so-called role models, in the uh, in in the movie in the movie business, in the artistic uh, uh, side of art, and many actors who we may have thought who were people honorable. Now we have learned how they have abused of others who were weak how they have abused uh, people of the opposite sex. So we see that, okay? Having a high social status, having a high education, uh, having a high levels of recognition does not mean that that equates or translates to having a high level of morality. Certainly not. So that being the case, and that being so well demonstrated by so many, we must ask ourselves a question. How then would such things be useful? You know, what? why would it be or how would it be useful for somebody to dedicate their lives into studying so many things and have one or two PhDs and, and have so many other degrees and certifications while in the meantime, the machine, <laughs> the, the, the thought machine that is running that human body, hmm? the emotional structure that is influencing that persona is carried with the worst psychological aggregates that we can find it has no use it sincerely serves no purpose how would it be useful for someone <clears throat> who spends years and years and many more years studying pseudo esoteric studies hmm? They like the new agey stuff and they like uh, uh, they like angel cards and they like to throw crystals and they like to uh, use uh, runes to predict the future and they like to do all of these things that are all very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, are, they are fun to many degrees. But how would that be useful to spend years doing that? and still create no internal change. It is useless. 
how would it be useful for us to spend 15 or 20 years doing yoga hmm? just the practice of yoga as we know it today throwing ourselves into rooms at 103 105 degrees and and stretching ourselves uh, for an hour certainly the body will see a lot of benefit from that but there is no tomorrow for the body the physical body just like the personality is born and it dies at its own time it is not eternal ultimately all of those practices they have no significant impact at all in the internal development how about spending years studying theosophy studying Rosi uh, rosicrucianism <laughs> hopefully i'm saying that word correctly in english Spending so many years going over so many books and so many videos and lectures in YouTube. If at the end of the day, it does not help eliminate your pain. If at the end of the day, you continue to respond and react over and over the same way that you have been reacting for the last same 10, 15 or 20 years. Then that is always a time. You know, knowing and being wisdom and the level of being they are both relative you know you can go to a doctor and you know very well that there are doctors that you would love hmm? doctors that give themselves wholeheartedly into the betterment of their patients maybe you know one or two of those maybe you know doctors that you certainly have no objection into trusting your life to their hands and at the same time there are other doctors that you certainly don't want them close to you or your children because maybe they would be better lawyers than doctors maybe they would be better mechanics than doctors but certainly not physicians so you see in all of these different roles that we play in society whether a doctor or an engineer or a technician or a teacher or a janitor these are all jobs that are very honorable and within those professions, we have different degrees of development. Hmm? Within those professions, all of them very honorable. We have various degrees within degrees of proficiency, of ability. And the same thing happens with us in this path of life that we have chosen to follow with the doctrine of Gnosis. Our level of being is very varied because our level of being could be compared to a thermometer you see when you look at a thermometer on one extreme of the thermometer you have cold and then the other one you have hot but there is no telling where is it that cold stops and hot begins hmm? between hot and cold there are infinite degrees of difference and the same thing happens with the level of proficiency of many doctors and engineers and janitors and mechanics and teachers, etc., etc. The same thing happens with saints. The same thing happens with many others who are very perverse. Hmm? Not all saints are created equal. Not all perverse people are at the same degree of perverseness. So all of these knowing and being, they are all relative. Even among the people who share their high doctoral degrees, even them, they look at each other with some level of, of superiorness or inferiorness. Many of them look to their peers hoping that they were as eloquent as they are. And many peers look at those others looking, hoping that they would be as understanding of the matter at hand as the others are. So it is all relative. You know, knowledge and being. We need, to, we need to learn here and now that they are designated differently. Hmm? Because when it comes to knowledge, those things that you know, you, you look at them and you see them as something that is true or something that is false. Something that is exact or something that is useless. Something that is accurate or not. Something that is precise or not. This is how we look at knowledge. 
But when it comes to being, when we look at someone's being, we don't say, oh, you are a true person or you are a false person. <laughs> we, don't, we don't say that. Huh? We don't say you, you are an exact person. <laughs> we, we never say something like that because it would be so silly. But we just say, you're a bad person. We just say, you are a good person. So we categorize knowingness and beingness in two different fields. And the nomenclature that refers to the being happens to be different than that which is used in knowledge. So we need to let that sink in for a little bit. Being and knowing are not related to each other. They are both relative. We know that. And within the back of our of, of the fabric of our social unconsciousness, we use specific nomenclatures to refer to one and the other. Friends, this is a matter of study that requires of you to not only absorb it here but to take it with you into an exercise of meditation so that you can extract by yourself a lot more wisdom out of this. Because our time in this lecture is, of course, limited. So we invite you, take that with you, and reflect deeply on it. But let's continue with our lecture. When, when it comes to our level of being, as we start working in our development, one of the initial stages that we experience is that of the level of a good housekeeper. And the fact is, is that we, before we make any significant progress, we have to demonstrate that we are good housekeepers. This particular level is fundamentally necessary to enter into the studies of Gnosis. To enter into the studies of Gnosis. What is that thing, the good housekeeper? Let's take, for example, uh, an expansion of Pietro Ruspensky's third canon of thought, in which, in his book, uh, The Objective of Pure Reasoning, he states, the exterior is a reflection of the interior. Hmm? The exterior is a reflection of the interior. And as we walk around in our homes... We all know that we have that magic kitchen drawer where everything ends up. That is the one chaotic kitchen drawer that we all have. We have that. We all know that there is one or more closets in our home where we have absolute chaos. We know that in our homes we have either a basement or an attic that may be dusty, musky, packed with things that we don't even remember what they are. Hmm? With old family heirlooms and things that we valued at some point in time, but that we have forgotten about them, and yet they are still there. Hmm? In every one of our homes, we all have those little uh, white little markings in the bathroom mirror. Hmm? So we all have these things. If we want to enter into the studies of Gnosis, let's take that third canon of thought, the exterior being a reflection of the interior. And by applying the law of philosophical analogies, we can see that our home is also a symbol of our own physicality. Hmm? Just like we have uh, our physical body here, our consciousness resides within the body, just like our body resides within the house itself. And better yet, let's look at the home as an extension of our intellectual center, hmm? of our head. Let's just say for the sake of argument of our mind. Hmm? And just like we would have the floors fairly clean and the home fairly organized for the most part, we know that there are areas within that mind in which we have some very deep, and disturbing experiences from the past that we carry thoughts, ill feelings, bad memories towards others in places that we choose to not remember. And we really need to be willing 
to get in there and do the dirty work of cleaning that up. Just like we need to be willing to take our home and sweep the floor and mop it so that we have a foundation that is clean, we have to be willing to do the same with this collection of devilish egos that we are carrying within our psyche. Can you see that? For us to be good housekeepers, we need to start at the physical level, in this plane of substance, by taking good care of our homes, by taking care of our relationship with our wife, taking care of our relationship with our husband, taking care of our children, making sure that we are presentable all the time. Because we do not dress up for ourselves. We dress up for others so that we do not invite negative impressions in others, so that they are not reacting, so that they are not adding more suffering to themselves and to everyone else around us. Hmm? So we don't do these things for ourselves. We need to start by being good housekeepers. We need to start in our home, in our relationships, with ourselves. And when we are performing at the level of the good housekeeper, it is then that we start making a change towards a superior level of being. Because friends, when it comes to the topic of Gnosis, Samael makes it very clear. If you're here and you're doing this, there are only two ways to get out of this. One of them is as a demon and the other one is as an angel. He makes it very clear. And he says that in more than one of his works. So the result of Gnosis is either an initiate or a Pharisee. You remember the story of the Pharisees? You remember the interactions of Caiaphas, that quote-unquote supreme priest, and the great master Yeshua ben Pandira, the great master Jesus? Hmm? It was Caiaphas, the one who ended up being and playing that role of the demon of ill will in that cosmic drama. Because on the outside, he was venerated, he was respected, hmm? he was seen as somebody very wise, the topic of wisdom. But when it came to his being, his level of being was very low. And this is what the great master Jesus refers to when he speaks of the Pharisees. On the outside, they are very clean, but on the inside, there is only filth. And that filth does not stay on the inside. It eventually comes out. And the exterior becomes a reflection of the interior. Hmm? The exterior, not only in terms of cleanliness and organization, but on the effects of the actions, on the things we say and the things that we do. Because it is the actions, the thing that truly counts here. Hmm? This is why the Apostle Matthew says, when he quotes the great master Jesus, the Christ, he quotes Jesus by saying, That which goes into the mouth does not defile the man. It is that which comes out of the mouth what defiles the man. And then when he said that, the disciples looked at him and said, Whoa, 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 wait. But uh, do you realize that the priests are getting offended with you saying this? And Jesus replies in his infinite wisdom, by saying, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. This is such a deep, profound, and powerful parable. And of course, the great Master Jesus speaks in parables so that everyone who listens can grasp something at their particular level of being. Hmm? A great Master. A great awakened master will hear those words and it will take them into a very deep state of reflection because the teaching is so profound. Hmm? For us at this level, we hear that and we go like, wow, yeah, that's, that's very true. <laughs> so you can see that the impact is very different. But this is the result of Gnosis. You walk out of here either as an initiate or a Pharisee. You take the wisdom and you put it to practice and you transform yourself through an internal revolution of the consciousness 
or you take the wisdom and you carry it and you speak to it and everybody thinks that you're great but in the meantime you just keep doing the stuff that you have been always doing hmm? we cannot afford to that second option we have gotten this as a gift with a gentle name it is up to us to put this into practice and to make the most of this particular moment as we look around we see that there is something that Samael refers to as the typical lunatic. <laughs> the typical lunatic. And we perhaps can identify many of these people close to us in our lives. These are people who are not suitable to receive these studies. However, many of them receive it. Many lunatics come into Gnosis and they receive all of this wisdom. And they methodically keep making progress through the pre-chamber and to the, into the intermediate levels. And many of them get very close into the advanced level studies. But they demonstrate that these, this wisdom, these studies, they are not suitable for them. Hmm? They are not. They are always questioning it. They are always doubting it. They are always thinking that there is something else. And they fail to realize that we have received this wisdom out of the lips of the Bodhisattva, of the of the great of the great soul of Mars. He has distilled all of this information that is out there, and he has given us the very best of yoga, the very best of what exists. In theosophy, the very best of what exists within the Rosicrucian doctrine, the very best of the Jewish theology, the very best of the Indian theology, the very best of Buddhism. It's all captured here. And he brings it up and demonstrates that this is indeed the root wisdom of all of the world's great religions. But yet that is not good enough for us. Hmm? So what is it that we need to do? <clears throat> in our actions and in our behavior, we need to be decent. We need to live life in balance. We need to live a life in equilibrium, in equanimity. That is how we need to live life. If we are dealing with a lunatic, someone who is openly receiving this wisdom and then he is, doesn't share it, or they don't share it, or he has taken this wisdom and they don't use it, in the meantime, they keep living their life doing the same things they have always done, stealing, lying, being adulterous, uh, abandoning their wives, uh, leaving their children, just going through, then there, there, there's a problem there. So when it comes to our own behavior, let's use this teaching as a gauge so that we can see where we stand. We need to make sure that we are living a life that is decent, that is balanced, hmm? that we are not abusing of others, that all of our interactions seek for what is the most beneficial for what is the thing that is mutually satisfying in everything that we do. Because when we do that, then we add that balance. And that balance is indeed very important. Samael shares with us some examples of, of these things that happen in his life. And he says, I met this guy, Mr. XX. <laughs> and he says that because he, he always said he liked to speak about the about the miracle, but never mention the saint. Because when we start mentioning names, we start slandering. So he said, Mr. XX, uh, he was a man who, who claimed to love his father. So of course, he's speaking about his internal father. He's speaking about his innermost. So he claimed that he loved his father and that he wanted to be reunited with the father, that he wanted to have his consciousness fused once again with the innermost. And he was very intense about saying these things. And as he did that, he became a fanatical vegetarian. Hmm? By now, you have already heard the lecture of the Pankatatwa ritual. Hmm? By now, you know from where I said that we get that atomic elemental of fire in the foods that we consume. Hmm? So he was pretty much bypassing all of that wisdom and he became a fanatical vegetarian. He, uh, because of financial situations and economies, he abandoned his wife. And with that, he abandoned his children and he ended up getting a divorce for no other reason other than just monies. But yet, he loved his father. Yet, 
he wanted to be reunited with his innermost. Hmm? And even as he abandoned his wife and abandoned his children and got divorced, he still meditated three to four hours a day. So he thought that he was doing great. When it came to the practice of Tantra, he was practicing Tantra with many women. Hmm? Samael says, he used to came to me to speak to me about the mysteries. What did Samael do? He told him, oh, I, I don't teach that anymore. Yeah, I abandoned all that. He lied to the man. Hmm? He lied to the man, deliberately lied to the man. And the man eventually went away. He walked away and left Samael alone. But he had to do that. He had to do that. Because he was coming to Samael looking for more knowledge. Hmm? He came to Samael looking for more wisdom. While at the same time, his level of being was making no progress. He was still ca caught in adultery. He was still caught in lust. He was still caught in desires and in ambition. Because we do have psychological aggregates of greed that are greedy to be saint-like. Hmm? So that is what he did. In another example from Master Samael, he says that uh, down the street from his home, there was a man walking and he was, uh, he was a bird catcher. So he had many birds in a, in a cage and he decided, Samael, decided to buy the birds from the man. So those birds, they had been in a cage for so long that they did not know how to fly. So he took those birds into his home and he started leaving, just letting the birds just fly around and he taught them to fly. And then a friend walked in and a friend say, why do you keep those birds here? Why do you keep them in prison? And Samael said, what about you? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing with yourself? What are you doing in your internal work? What are you doing with the birds that you have yourself? <laughs> and Samael took the birds and he set them free. Which is the reason why he bought them. Because he really did not want to see those birds in a cage. So you see, how is it that we do things? How is it that even those who come to us and offer us this deep, meaningful wisdom, how we project in them our own insecurities, how we project in them our own defects? This is what we do. So in this topic of wisdom and being, we have plenty of examples of, of things that are happening nowadays. You know, Perhaps we need to do this as an exercise in self-reflection. So maybe, maybe, you find yourself speaking of Gnosis. Hmm? And you speak of Gnosis very well, and you can explain the concepts, and you can be very eloquent about it. But in the meantime, you walk out on the street and you make no effort to control your eyes. And if there is a woman who walks past you, hmm? you undress him with your sight. And if there is a handsome man with his corpulent, chiseled body walking by, maybe you look at him, maybe if it's just for an instant, and that is just enough to satisfy your need of that impression. Hmm? So we need to understand what is it that we're doing. Because that may not be crude lust, but it is lust at the end of the day. That is what it is. So we could be speaking of Gnosis, but if we are making no effort to control our reactions, then are we actually putting aside safeguarding of our creative power to make it available for spiritual work? What about those of us who speak of Gnosis, but in the meantime, we judge and we criticize others? Hmm? Maybe we judge them, and we don't say anything, but the judgment happens in the level of the mind. Maybe we don't say anything about them, but internally we skin them alive, hmm? because they deserve it for what they did, us, did to us. Hmm? We have to be very watchful about how is it that these reactions are affecting our thinking, how these reactions are affecting our emotions, how they even affect our habits. Look, we could be speaking of the wisdom of Gnosis, but in the meantime, 
we could be doing many things so that others desire us so that we look inviting to others we could do this through our selfies we can do this through our makeup we can do this uh, through our ways of dressing our ways of speaking the way that we walk and that we conduct in front of others so if we are not watchful we are missing all of these opportunities to discover these defects in us you know we could be speaking of gnosis but maybe we are not making any significant effort to control our inner Don Juan or our inner Doña Ines if if you're a lady listening to this lecture and what is that Don Juan what is that Doña Ines that is that aspect of lust that we have that would like to have many lovers hmm? that not only wants to be desired but that wants to receive that affection from others this is the typical story of uh, that rhetorical sailor that has a girlfriend in every pier that he stops. Hmm? Many of us do that. And we would like to see many people at work just adoring us, desiring us. And that is an internal Doña Ines. That is an internal Don Juan. Friends, in our cruelty, perhaps there are many of us who speak of the wisdom of Gnosis, but in the meantime, we're cruel to our children. We speak of how is it that we must be and must behave, and we speak about revolutionizing our consciousness. But in the meantime, we, we scream and we yell to our children. Hmm? Maybe we abuse of them emotionally. In many instances, many abuse of them physically. And we justify it as tough love. When in reality, it is anger, it is hatred. It is old feelings of resentment that are being projected into our children when they have nothing to do with that. This is what the internal Pharisee does. On the outside, it looks like something. On the inside, it is something horrendous. And what about all of us carrying the wisdom of Gnosis, but when we see someone who is suffering, we look the other way. When we see somebody homeless, that you can tell that they are not okay because they are filthy and they smell and they are speaking to themselves. We just walk on the other sidewalk. Hmm? When in reality, the consciousness is there and it's trapped. That being is suffering. So we cannot be speaking of Gnosis and just look the other way. Look the other way in bullying. Look the other way when there is social injustice. No. This work requires of us to be courageous. Because if we are here, we are here because we have an active magnetic center. If we are receiving this wisdom, it is not by coincidence. This wisdom is a gift from our innermost. This is a gift that those great masters are offering us so that we can have an opportunity to just get out of this valley of suffering. But the fact is, is that many people have that magnetic center active and they are very open to receiving all of this mysticism and mystical practices and all of this philosophy, all of this science, all of this religion. Because there is an element of religare here, of reunion, which is what religion truly means. But other people don't have it. But dear friend, if you're listening to this, you're listening to this because your magnetic center is active. And this is an opportunity that you cannot just discard. And now that you're here, then realize the work that you have ahead of yourself. Because now that you have received it, Getting out of here is either as a Pharisee or as an initiate. We all have taken a look at us. By now at this level of studies, we know for a fact that we are indeed individually a legion. Hmm? That there is a big multitude of devilish egos roaming within the psyche. Hmm? That they are just waiting for the right moment. And by now we have done enough direct observation to know that many of them present themselves in ways that are non-threatening. Hmm? 
So because they're not threatening, we just let them express themselves. And they gain their strength. And these are problems that we're going to have to deal with later. So our purpose here is to stop this legion. Our purpose here is to strive to achieve a sacred individuality hmm? so that our own innermost that is a multiplicity can express itself as an individual perfect unity. Hmm? Because through that effort, it is that we can reach the unity of life. Friends, there is a difference between wisdom and being hmm? we need to understand what is our current level of being the more of our defects that we can observe the more of our defects that we can comprehend well the more of our defects that we can eliminate with the intervention of our divine mother the more defects we eliminate the more calmness we bring into our mind the calmer is that mind the easier it becomes for us to be able to hear listen to that silent voice the voice of the innermost and the more experience we have the closer we can get to our innermost the happier we can be and what this ultimately tells us is that we have an opportunity to experience heaven on earth. But we cannot experience heaven on earth for as long as we continue getting angry for silliness. We cannot experience heaven on earth for as long as we continue carrying forth so many resentments, so much jealousy, that we still have a void and empty ambitions and greed for bigger homes and better cars and uh, better social status and all of these things that are just so transitory. So I'm going to leave you here with the words of Master Samael Ombrior. And he says, Do not forget the need to be, before all else, equilibrated. Not lunatics. Hmm? Not poor housekeepers. He says, the path begins at home. The harder the gymnasium, the better it is. So let's not complain about those difficult moments. Let's not continue thinking that we are victims because what we are experiencing is the consequence of all those things that we have behaved ourselves into. Rather than complaining, Capitalize on the moment. Give yourself an instant before you react and observe your thinking and observe your emotions and observe your habits. Hmm? What are your hands? What are your feet doing? Observe what is your instinctive impulse that is manifesting at that moment because most likely it'll be one of survival hmm? based on fear or any other, any other defect. And see how this all drains you of your creative power. Use that information wisely and diligently. Hmm? And as you do that, learn to steal the fire out of that devilish ego. When you steal that fire, you bring light into that darkness. With that level of comprehension, when you are ready to it, whether you are married or single, transmute willingly your creative power, your creative water, whether in the great arcanum of, or through pranayama or hamsa. And as you transmute that energy, make it available to your Divine Mother. Offer it for your spiritual work and ask of her to Eliminate that defect that you have thoroughly comprehended. And dear friends, we can tell you that she will do it. And you will experience it. Friends, this is what we wanted to share with you. Uh, we are certainly very grateful to all those uh, from which uh, we have sourced these images to make this presentation uh, possible to you. Thank you, dear friends.
uh, we would like to say thank you so much for joining us today. May all beings be happy.